In this mini lecture, we are going to briefly talk about some rules that we have to draw electric field lines, and we're also going to talk about conductors. Our electric field is a vector. We already mentioned that a bit. The fields due to two or more charges are the sum of the individual vectors from each of our charges. And the field lines that we can draw for the electric field vectors help us visualize the resulting sum of the effects of our individual charges in the system. Here we have an example of what the electric field looks like around two like charges. Um, we've got two positive charges here. So my electric field lines are going to be drawn pointing outward and away from our positive charges. Now, now our electric field vectors also show us the direction of electric force for a positive test charge that we would place in the system. Because these are positive charges and because these are both like charges, okay, those electric the, uh, the electric force between these two charges is repulsive. Our electric field lines are gonna try to diverge away from each other. So in particular, in the space between my two charges, because they have like um, charges, those electric fields are gonna really try to diverge away from each other, especially in the middle, okay? Now, at every little point along any of these field lines, we can calculate the sum or the total electric field there due to the presence of Q1 and Q2. So for example, at point P here, we want to find the total electric field vector at that point. And that would be this vector that's drawn in here, which just is E. At this particular point, we've got a vector representing the electric field at that point due to charge one. Here, this vector is the electric field at that point due to charge two. It's the sum of them together that gives us the direction of this electric field line. And then you can do the same at any point along these electric field lines. Actually, you can calculate, you could choose any point within here to calculate the total electric field, and then you could draw the direction of the electric field line vector. And you could do this whole mapping system where you could, you could literally map out every single space on my whiteboard here uh, to figure out what is the direction of the electric field at that point. And then you could also draw contours to show your electric field lines in this case. Now we have rules for drawing these electric field lines. Here are five of them. All right. Our field lines must begin on positive charges and terminate on negative charges. So the field line is always pointing away from positive charges, pointing toward negative charges. Our second rule, the number of field lines leaving a positive charge or entering a negative charge is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. If your charge is greater, you're gonna have a greater electric field because of the presence of that charge. So you'll get, you're gonna have more electric field lines coming into or out of a charge that has um, a greater magnitude. The strength of the electric field is proportional to the closeness of the field lines. More precisely, it's proportional to the number of field lines per unit area, perpendicular to those lines. So uh, let's say I look at my image up here, image A, and I'm gonna draw a line right here where I'm moving my pointer up and down, okay? When I draw that line here, imagine I put a piece of paper perpendicular to the screen here that we're seeing. So there are more field lines per unit area in this region than there would be field lines per unit area up here or up here. So the electric field is gonna be greater right here than it is up here or up here. Okay, that's what this is saying, three. So essentially you can see that the electric field is stronger where these field lines are clustered closer together. So the electric field is gonna be stronger, closer to the charge 
it's going to be weaker further away from the charges. And we just know that by looking at the equation for the electric field. The direction of the electric field is tangent to the field line at any point in space. So that's just saying that wherever I draw one of these field lines, the electric field is going to lie right along at that point, um, that, that, that line that I drew. Okay? And our electric field lines can never cross. You cannot cross paths, just like in Ghostbusters, you can't cross the streams, you can't cross your electric field lines in your drawings. But here we have an example of our electric field line drawings for two charges that are opposite charges now. And this top image, we've got our electric field lines for two charges that are of um, like charge, but they're both negative charges. With our negative charges, um, our field lines must terminate on those charges. So you see there's arrows on these field lines and the direction of those field lines are coming in toward your negative charges. And since these are like charges, these field lines are going to want to diverge. Now, if we also think about the strength of the field is proportional to the closeness of these field lines, you see here in the middle, there are no field lines drawn. So that tells me that the field must be very weak in the space between my charges, okay? But it's gonna be stronger kind of over here on the opposite side of these charges because the field lines are more closely compacted to each other. Um, down here, we've got two opposite charges. And if our rule is that the positive um, field lines must begin on positive charges and terminate on negative charges, well, we've got the direction of my field line here. It's starting on the positive charge and it's terminating on my negative charge. So um, you know, that's the direction that you draw the field lines when you have two opposite charges. And then we could also do the same scenario. We could think about where is the electric field the strongest here? The electric field is going to be the strongest closer to those charges. And it's going to be um, weaker in places where those electric field lines start to diverge. So with that in mind, um, the question I'm going to have you answer for your in concept engagement question is this first one. Rank the magnitudes of the electric fields at points A, B, and C from the largest magnitude to the weakest magnitude for this image right here. We've got two positive charges. We see that our field lines are um, leaving, coming out of our positive charges. Um, but think about the closeness of these electric field lines and what that means for um, the strength of the uh, electric field at those points in order to determine um, the magnitude of the electric fields at these points A, B, and C. Now for this second image here, we talked about how the magnitude of the charge is proportional to the number of field lines that are entering or leaving that charge. We can determine the ratio here of our charge Q1 to charge Q2. And we can also determine the sign of Q1 and Q2 based on this image. So based on just this image, I'm not asking you to talk about this, the second one in your concept engagement, just this one on the left. Based on this image, we know that Q2 is a positive charge and Q1 is a negative charge because our field lines are leaving from Q2 and they're coming toward Q1. So Q2 is positive, Q1 is negative. The ratio of Q1 to Q2, we just count up the number of field lines and set up a ratio, set up a fraction. So Q1 has one, two, three, four, five, six, six field lines coming out of it. Q2 has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So we take six field lines for Q1 divided by 18 Q li uh, uh, field lines for Q2, six over 18 um, is one third. So that tells us that Q1 is one third the magnitude of Q2 or Q2 three times the magnitude of Q1.
one. And for uh, the last few minutes here, we're going to talk about electric fields and conductors. Conductors are materials that um, are easily able to conduct electricity. They're easily able to attract charges. Conductors contain free charges that move easily within them. So that's why they're good for conducting electricity. Excess charges placed on a conductor quickly respond to create a state of static uh, equilibrium. The electric field is zero everywhere inside the conducting material. And all of the excess charge, excess charge beyond neutral, on an isolated conductor reside on the surface. So those charges want to move to the surface of the conductor. The electric field just outside our charged conductor is perpendicular to the conductor's surface. So here's our conductor. This conductor has an excess of positive charges. Um, so it's got a, um, um, a reduced amount of negative charges. It has a deficiency of negative charges. And so that distribution of charges is going to try to distribute themselves evenly all across the body of the conductor. Inside the conductor, the electric field is zero. But just here at the surface, the electric field is perpendicular everywhere to the surface. So everywhere you could draw these radial lines perpendicular to the surface, and that's um, the way in which we could draw electric fields coming off of a conductor. Now, um, properties of conductors are incredibly important for our lives. Um, lightning rods are a great example of um, a conductor in action. And this is how they work. So on irregularly shaped conductors, like a lightning rod that has a tipped point here, the charges are going to accumulate at the sharp points where the radius of curvature on the surface is the smallest. Now, in our previous example, we had a, a nice spherical conductor, but here we've got a conductor that has some um, <laughs> irregular shape to it. So yes, all of the excess positive charge is gonna to want to accumulate here toward the most pointy end. So, you know, lightning rods are often found on buildings, especially tall buildings, they're used to prevent the buildup of large excess charges on the structure of the building. So the electric field is going to be incredibly sharp, very strong at the point here, and it can exert a force large enough to transfer charge on or off the conductor. So especially in a thunderstorm, if you've got like this really big tall skyscraper that is living within the um, the electricity of that thunderstorm, the corners of the building are going to start collecting excess charge. But if you put some of these lightning rods on top of the building that have that are conductors and they have these pointed surfaces where they have a large buildup of excess charge, then you can discharge the building through those pointed lightning rods rather than on the bulk of the building itself. So you can try to protect um, certain structures in that way. This also relates to you being inside your car during a thunderstorm. You are safer in your car during a lightning storm than you are outside. Why? Well, you are inside your car. The shell of your car is a conductor. So all of the charges on the conductor, your car, are going to be residing on the metal shell, the surface of the car that's outside, you know, outside in the weather. So when you're inside your car, let's say, and your car would happen to get struck by lightning, all of that excess charge would be distributed over the shell of your car and it would keep you safe inside because as we saw, the electric field inside a conductor is zero.